Doctor Who has a reputation as a breezy science fiction show, but the character of the Doctor isn't all jelly babies, question mark umbrellas and jammy dodgers. The Doctor has laid waste to countless alien races, imprisoned their enemies in unbreakable chains, and presumably done many terrible things at the behest of Division. That's one of the most compelling things about every incarnation of the Doctor. One minute they can be wolfing down fish fingers and custard, and the next they're pointing a loaded gun at an alien war criminal, and you truly believe they might actually pull the trigger. I'm Ellie for Who Culture, and this is Every Doctor's Darkest Moment. The First Doctor Attempted Murder of a Caveman The First Doctor never saw himself as a hero, and some of his darker actions prove this. Many of them come in an unearthly child, from the kidnap of Ian and Barbara to an attempted murder. When the caveman Tsar is wounded by a wild animal, he becomes an impediment to the TARDIS crew's escape. So the Doctor picks up a rock and advances on him, seemingly to put him out of his misery. In these very early days of the First Doctor, he clearly puts the survival of himself and Susan above all else. It was an incredibly dark moment that established the Doctor's more alien logic driven morality. The second Doctor experimenting on Jamie. There's a lot of darkness hiding under the shabby exterior of the second Doctor. His most notable shady moment comes in The Evil of the Daleks when he manipulates his companion Jamie McCrimmon. Jamie is being used by the Daleks and the Doctor to test the human factor, something that the sinister salt shakers want to understand to improve their military strategy. It's later revealed to be part of a larger plan by the Doctor to defeat the Daleks once and for all by, quote, infecting them with the human traits of cooperation and compassion. Jamie chastises the Doctor for his manipulation, and it stings to see this particular TARDIS team briefly at odds with each other. However, it's another strong example of how the Doctor's big picture thinking doesn't always guarantee the safety of his companions. Before we continue, we just want to take a moment to thank our paid partner for this video, which is BetterHelp. Just like the Doctor, we all have dark moments in our lives. I mean, granted, we don't have to deal with the Weeping Angels or the Daleks, but we all have those everyday struggles that can be a big drain mentally. And we've just seen in the 14th Doctor the enormous comfort and relief he found in just having someone to lean on, having someone there for him. And the same is true for everyone really, isn't it? And that's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp connects you with a credential therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. And you can do all of it from your phone or your computer via call, video chat or messaging, however you feel most comfortable. It's the easiest possible way to start talking to a therapist. All you have to do is follow the link in the description, which which is betterhelp.com forward slash who culture for 10% off your first month of therapy. Now, usually you'll be matched with a therapist within 48 hours, so you can get started straight away. That's betterhelp.com forward slash who culture for a 10% discount on your first month of therapy. The Fourth Doctor Not Destroying the Daleks. The Fourth Doctor era is one of the darkest in all of Doctor Who, garnering multiple complaints from the puritanical Mary Whitehouse. And yet, Tom Baker's beloved incarnation of the Doctor largely keeps his nose clean. Harrison Chase gets ground into compost, but that wasn't the Fourth Doctor's fault, and he did tell Sarah to shut the machine off. Vinder Kay gets a bomb placed in his coat, but the Doctor was just playing on the villain's greed, really. Isn't the Fourth Doctor's darkest moment his decision to not destroy the Daleks at their inception? For all the Doctor's moralising about how the universe could become a better place by uniting against the Daleks, isn't it also true that he doomed countless lives in the process? As Sarah tells the Doctor in Genesis of the Daleks, he can't doubt that the universe would be better without the Daleks. For all his talk about how the universe needs a common threat to stand against, wouldn't it be nicer if there was no threat at all? The Fifth Doctor Burning the Master to Death In Planet of Fire, the Master schemed to harness the restorative powers of a rare gas on the planet San after he accidentally shrank himself. Using the Doctor's ropey robot companion Chameleon to orchestrate events, the Master lured the TARDIS to San and attempted to have his old enemy killed. Learning of the scheme, the Fifth Doctor euthanized Chameleon before turning his attention to his old friend. As the Master used the gas to restore himself to his natural height and gain a new regeneration cycle, the Doctor turned the gas up. This seemingly burned the master alive while he begged and pleaded for his lives. It's a weirdly violent ending for a silly story about a shrunken master. As if Honey We Shrunk the Kids ended with Rick Moranis accidentally locking his shrunken kids in the oven. A very dark moment for the charming fifth doctor. The sixth doctor strangling Perry. 
Forget the acid baths and chloroforming shock eye to death, the Sixth Doctor throttling Perry in The Twin Dilemma is truly his darkest moment. While the Sixth Doctor immediately feels remorse for strangling his companion, it's hard to escape how sinister an action this is. Especially as the brutal assault takes place not long after her new friend saved her life, then completely changed his face. The darkness of the moment feels like a cheap way to establish that Colin Baker is a very different Doctor from Peter Davison. Especially as producer John Nathan Turner and Colin Baker discussed embracing the Doctor's darker and more alien side in the Sixth Doctor era. If anyone had turned off during Peter Davison's tenure, it's hard to imagine them jumping on board for a snarling, technicolor, dream-coated Doctor who tries to murder his companions. It's one extreme to another, really. The Seventh Doctor using Ace as a pawn against Fenric. In The Curse of Fenric, it was revealed that the Doctor and Ace were brought together by the titular evil being. While goading Fenric, the Doctor claims that he would never have travelled with Ace if she hadn't been one of his wolves. The Doctor's explanation for his cruelty is that he had to break Ace's faith in him to defeat Fenric, which was why he was so cruel to her. He's obviously telling the truth as the Seventh Doctor clearly loves Ace. However, the Doctor always knew that he would have to betray Ace at some point, and spent their time together building her faith and trust in him so that he could cruelly break it at the correct moment. As Sylvester McCoy might say, it's a pretty dark way to treat your companion. The Eighth Doctor becoming the War Doctor. As the time war raged across the cosmos, the Eighth Doctor was given a choice. Mortally wounded after crashing to the surface of the planet Khan, the Sisterhood offered him a choice of who he would become next. The Eighth Doctor could have regenerated into another incarnation. This ninth incarnation could have remained as the hopeful hero that muddled on through, helping out on the fringes of the conflict between the Daleks and the Time Lords. But instead, the Eighth Doctor actively chose to turn his back on the name of the Doctor and embrace the warrior persona. The Night of the Doctor was one of the real highlights of Doctor Who's 50th anniversary. By showing us how the Time War had broken the most youthful, energetic and romantic of the first eight Doctors, Stephen Moffat demonstrated how hopeless a conflict it truly was. The Ninth Doctor Torturing a Dalek the Ninth Doctor had some very dark moments, which hinted at the psychological scars left by the Time War. The earliest of these was when he coolly watched Cassandra dry up from a lack of moisture and promptly explode all over her assembled guests. However, an even darker moment comes when he shows actual glee at being presented with an unarmed and helpless Dalek. The rage and anger that the Ninth Doctor shows while taunting his enemy, practically spitting into its eye stalk before trying to electrocute it to death, is an astonishing performance by Christopher Eccleston. Both the Doctor and the Dalek are redeemed by the end, thanks to their shared connection with Rose. However, it's a fascinating insight into how badly the Time War affected the Doctor's psyche. The Tenth Doctor, the Time Lord Victorious The moment at the end of The Waters of Mars where Adelaide Brooks steps inside her house and shoots herself in the head is one of the darkest scenes in all of Doctor Who. So of course, the Time Lord Victorious is the Tenth Doctor's darkest moment. It reveals how angry and lost the Doctor is without Donna Noble, or without a companion in general, and demonstrates the full extent of his powers as a Lord of Time. If it weren't for Adelaide, the Tenth Doctor could have gone on to rampage through the vortex, bending reality to his own sense of morality and justice. Despite nipping this in the bud fairly quickly, the moment in the end of time where the Tenth Doctor rages at Wilf because he's capable of so much more is a worrying flash of the Time Lord Victorious underneath the surface. The Eleventh Doctor Killing Solomon there's no question that Solomon was a scumbag who deserved to be punished for the murder of the Silurians, the mistreatment of the dinosaurs, and his attempt to kidnap Nefertiti. But isn't the Eleventh Doctor using him as bait for a fatal missile strike a little bit too much? From Harrison Chase to the Master, there have been plenty of times where the Doctor has thrown out a hand to a villain to save them from a nasty end. No such mercy was shown to Solomon, who is given a handy missile homing beacon by the Eleventh Doctor. It's a weird move, because Nefertiti had already saved herself from Solomon's clutches. Her and the Eleventh Doctor could have simply taken Solomon back to the Ark and sent him away to be dealt with non-lethally. Instead, they left him to go the way of the dinosaurs. The Twelfth Doctor shooting the General Doctor Who spent years making us believe that regeneration was essentially a rebirth after the previous body died. Hellbent told us that, on Gallifrey at least, regeneration is just like having man flu. It's a glib aside from the Twelfth Doctor to reassure us that he didn't just gun down the general in cold blood. Of course, that's the whole point of Hellbent, which bravely asks the question, what would a Doctor Who finale be like with the Doctor as the big bad? The Twelfth Doctor's darkest moment is the culmination of the threats levelled at me in Face the Raven and his time 
Time Lord jailers in Heaven Sent. The death of Clara Oswald pushed him over the edge and made the Doctor turn his back on everything he believed in. The 13th Doctor, selling out the Master to the Nazis. The 13th Doctor removing the Master's perception filter in Spyfall was a controversial moment that led to much discussion on social media. However, the Master's skin colour is irrelevant in the Doctor's decision. She's merely exposing him to the Nazis as someone who's infiltrated their ranks. And yet, that in itself is pretty dark. The Master is obviously a very bad guy, but the prospect of him being captured by the Nazis and brutally interrogated as a spy is incredibly bleak indeed. Indeed. It's a weirdly dark punishment from one of the brightest and most joyful of the Doctors. That further proves that World War II and actual Nazis aren't always the most suitable antagonists in Doctor Who. Yes, we're looking at you. Let's kill Hitler. The 14th Doctor, salting the edge of the universe. Wild Blue Yonder is full of weird, dark moments, from the Doctor's arms being too long to the giant Doctor and Donna being stuffed into a corridor. But the Doctor and Donna can't be blamed for the weirdness of the not-things and their never-ending quest to learn how to be moving, thinking beings. And yet, they do inspire this Mayfly Doctor to do the darkest thing in his three-episode stint. The 14th Doctor marking a salt line at the edge of the universe is his darkest moment because it's literal black magic. The Doctor clearly picked up a thing or two from his adventure at Devil's End. It might have tricked the not-things for a minute, but invoking black magic rites at the edge of reality itself meant that the toy maker came a-calling. It's yet another example of the Doctor's recklessness causing future problems. The 15th Doctor, impaling the Goblin King. It's too early to tell what Shooty Gatwa's darkest moment will be as the 15th Doctor, but the climax of the church on Ruby Road is already in the competition. After the Doctor denies the King his baby bones, the goblins travel back in time and decide to have a delicious Ruby Sunday instead. The Doctor's pretty furious about this, not least because of the impact it has on Ruby's foster family. So he travels back in the TARDIS, presumably to get back aboard the ship, give the Goblin King a big speech about embracing a plant-based diet, and job done. Baby saved, right? Right? wrong. The 15th Doctor instead uses his Mavity gloves to yank the Goblin King's ship out of the sky and onto the spire of the church on Ruby Road. In doing so, he impales the big lad on the church spire, hot fuzz style. One episode in and already a murder. Merry Christmas everyone! Well, these were the Doctor's darkest moments, but why not check out the darkest Doctor Who moments? In the meantime, I've been Ellie for Who Culture, and in the words of Riversong herself, goodbye sweeties.